and so he asked me to help us out. Today is my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, John Tabidi Willis, to give our October Kassar talk. Tabidi is a scholar of the social and cultural history of Africa in the Atlantic and Indian Ocean worlds, and he holds a PhD in history from Emory University. He also holds the position of Associate Professor of African History at the African Institute in Sharjah. And he's an Associate Professor of African History at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. In his 2018 book titled Masquerading Politics, Kin Kinship, Gender, and Ethnicity in a Yoruba Town, Atta, 1774-1928, to to Tabidi delves into the role of institutions employing ritual masquerades in reflecting and shaping changing political and economic relations during pivotal periods such as the rise and decline of West African empires, Atlantic slavery, the spread of Islam, and the establishment of Christian missions and British colonialism. Over the past decade, Tabidi has dedicated his research to uncovering the historical and cultural significance of Africa's contributions to the pearling industry in the Persian Gulf. And he is here today to talk to us about that research, um, along with his sister Valerie and his cousin Renee, uh, who are also here from the United States. So welcome to them. Um, and please join me in welcoming Tabidi Willis to the podium. Thank you so much, Mark, um, for your generous uh, warm welcome, uh, hospitality, friendship. Uh, thank you, that's me, uh, all the work you've done uh, in making this more possible. Uh, to other members of the history department, uh, GAP, uh, the Center uh, for American uh, Studies. Uh, it's really an honor and privilege to be here. Thank you all um, for coming, uh, as well as students, staff, Others just interested in the intellectual conversation uh, and engagement. Uh, so, there are a few other parties that have been really helpful uh, in advancing this research, uh, also to mention. Um, so, for in the January and in June, I participated in a uh, GIS Institute uh, at Harvard. Uh, and worked on some of the maps that you're going to see here, and I'll talk a bit about that work in the second half of the presentation. Um, this work is also supported by Melody Directions Grant uh, that I've been working on uh, for the last three years, uh, as well as the Bahrain Authority for Culture and Antiquities, um, some of the sites associated with here in the first half of the presentation. Uh, and there are countless research assistants, uh, GIS specialists, at Carleton College, who first introduced me to GIS uh, and then helped me uh, do some early work in terms of with the data that I'll uh, be showcasing in a moment uh, and making maps uh, as well. The outline of my presentations, uh, as you see here on the screen, so I'll talk a bit about uh, research uh, and I'll ground it in the focus on heritage sites uh, in the Gulf questions that I began to uh, ask of them, uh, and the way that led me then to look at British Navy mission records uh, in the Gulf. Uh, I'll then talk about the ways in which I use uh, GIS, uh, Geographic Information Systems, and I'll talk about what that is, what that represents, um, as a tool with which to help archive, uh, organize, uh, and analyze the data represented in British Bank mission records and ultimately create maps uh, from them. So that, and then I'll come to some larger uh, patterns uh, in the data, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges uh, of working with uh, such data and how we always need to be thinking critical about our evidence, um, uh, how it's generated, and how we interpret it uh, toward what end. Um, and then invite you to to respond, to engage, to ask questions, to push back against, uh, and to generate insights that I have considered with a lot of uh, 
as well. And so again, I'm really happy to be here uh, and really looking forward to, to hearing your thoughts uh, about this work. So heritage sites and studies of pearling in the Gulf focus predominantly on men who labored as pearl divers, boat captains, uh, and merchants. At a range of sites, you see this represented, whether as the National Museum, like in the case of Bahrain, the Dubai Museum, the Emirates NDB Pearling Museum, Emirates NDB is a bank, uh, and so that even signals the connection of uh, the pearling industry historically leading into banking uh, in the Gulf. It's not the main focus of the presentation, but again, it helps you understand the significance um, of the environment that I'm talking about. Um, I live in Mater House, uh, which is a house devoted to a prominent pearl trading family, one of the most prominent uh, in the Gulf, in Bahrain. Right? So you see, in a number of places, you see heritage sites, again, focusing on men. And as you look closely, you begin to see that the narrative being portrayed is of the notion of that it's nature. It's the dangers of being at sea, right? Uh, chance, divine intervention, that are represented as the main adversary for the divers. More recently, scholars have been working with British manumission records that depict that tell a different story, right? That tell a story about the experience of enslaved peoples. So these British manumission records taken from the 1906 to 1949, uh, about not over 900, drawing from the locations you see represented here, tell a story of people's experience of capture, transit, various places from East Africa or the Nile Valley region into the Gulf or being born into slavery um, or, uh, or captured in the Gulf. Transited around from various locations, identified uh, sometimes uh, who the enslaved person remembers as their seller, places where they were transited, uh, passed through, and then the locations and the type of work they did in those locations. They, uh, typically end with some sense of the hardship, the brutality that people experience, um, which provide justification in the narrative that they're offering to the British political agents, who have developed a relationship with the local rulers uh, in various Gulf states, that if individuals could show signs of abuse, right, so only in instances in which they could show some evidence of abuse right, that could be recognized, that they would be receive uh, a manumission certificate from the British political agent. Um, so of course this is in the age of uh, uh, abolition, uh, and after you know, nearly a century of British Royal Navy activities in the Atlantic, uh, and then increasingly in the Indian Ocean uh, region, seeking to police uh, the strait, and really being mobilized to protect British imperial interests in the context of the Indian Ocean in India. Right? So that's the larger political context in which the British uh, are concerned about you know, what some have uh, called the myth of Arab piracy um, and seeking to uh, seeking to work out relations with various families that, that have, in essence, become the major ruling families uh, within the world uh, in order to organize trade to protect the shared uh, commercial interest and a larger imperial interest, uh, of course, for the British. Uh, here you see, so overwhelmingly, these many mission certificates uh, record the testimonies of men. Uh, and, begin to, you know, to think about, you know, why is it then that men would seem to end up uh, more represented uh, in those who are able to arrive at the offices of British political agents and see the mission and women. This might have something to do with the way in which labor was organized, the way in which their 
activities and movements were organized as enslaved people. Um, the men referenced uh, in these re the women referenced, referenced in these records were primarily in some form of domestic work or engaged in um, water carrying, so the transit of water from local wells uh, to households. Um, where men were primarily engaged in pearling, whether as divers or pullers on pearl diving vessels, um, uh, or engaged in data production, uh, in data extraction. Right, as well. right, this, is, this is part of a global data uh, production industry um, as well. Right, and so in that context, then one could argue that women's location movements being primarily within, surrounding the household, then that there are more barriers for them to then, for escape, and to land all the way uh, to the households in which political agents are the, for the state, uh, uh, the political agency, versus men who were out at sea for months on end, uh, who at times were able to in, in return, uh, not only back to shore, but then moving from the port to the household, were able to um, uh, so have uh, escape. You also do have uh, within these records um, significant numbers of, of applicants that were families. Um, so there were instances, whether it's men or women, able to escape uh, with their children, um, with their husbands or their wives, uh, as well and reach the office of the British. So again, here you see, are you seeing my mouse movements? So on the top uh, image to the far to the top right, um, you see a spike, right, in the number of applicants, right? This is during the time of Mickey Moto starts producing cultural pearls uh, in Japan, uh, which begins to plummet the global demand for pearls coming from the Gulf. Increasing supply. Right, lowering costs, right, uh, which again uh, hurt the demand for pearls coming, uh, pearls coming from the Gulf. And in such conditions, uh, there seems to be uh, evidence and a correlation of increased abuse uh, by, uh, by slave owners, right, uh, by slave owners in the context of holding individuals in captivity. So or instances in which divers were able to kind of contract their labor out to, to earn money outside of the, uh, the household uh, and the domain of their owner, uh, and could use those funds to, 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 to free themselves, to pay for their own ammunition within kind of local patterns of ammunition as well. Um, so individuals, as you hear, you see this in testimonies, uh, reporting um, being chained, prevented from uh, denied food, uh, provision, uh, being denied the opportunity to be able to go out and earn uh, living for themselves. Uh, you see incidents of physical, or hints at um, physical abuse um, as well within the applicants, applications. Um, and there'll be references at times to Individuals show signs of abuse noted in the have been written and handed um, by the British political agent on typed documents. Important to note here as well you know, are the way in which the British political agent participates in a kind of and this is where those who are thinking about this talk in relationship to kind of American studies, um, to think about this in the context of the development of racialization, the relationship of race and slavery, and the role that the ways the British political agents identifies individuals as a part of that process of racialization itself. Right? So British political agents identifying individuals as African, primarily African, each, and then within that, um, especially in relationship to African, um, often identify um, people as Swahili or Ethiopian um, um, or Sudan. Um, 
So there's a way in which, you know, this is kind of foreshadowing the argument about the challenge of working with the data. The data is inconsistent in the variables it's using uh, to, to describe and characterize the conditions. In some instances, it's, it's drawing on some larger racialized sense of African, Arab, Creole, mixed African and Arab, or mixed Baluch, right? Um, but in other instances, then it's using this kind of regional designation, uh, or kind of cultural overlapping with regional, like Swahili, uh, as a way of classifying the region as well. Right? If you travel to Zanzibar or places on the Swahili coast, um, you, you know, who is in, in, visually is identified as African or Arab um, or even Persian. So, you know, there are times in which it seems more self-evident. There are other times in which it seems very difficult to be able to, to locate individuals. Right? So again, this reflects the ways in which the British political leaders themselves are engaged in the process of racialization. Uh, and in a context that I would argue is about trying to make people legible for exploitation within a growing commercial, um, uh, colonial uh, economic system uh, uh, as well. Right? And I think, again, I think that's partly at play in terms of the way in which there are a wide range of categories that are used to describe people of African descent, um, but not in terms of Arab. Now, I recognize even African versus Arab, you know, as I tell my students, these are historically contingent categories that haven't been used inconsistently across space and time, right? Um, so, I've seen a number of headlines, I guess I'm going to put that. Uh, there are a number of scholars that focus on uh, slavery and manumission in the Gulf, some of which uh, represent here, who, again, going back to the notion of the heritage sites, really offer that counter-narrative of seeing that it's human uh, agency that has been the kind of chief adversary for, for divers, uh, for, for divers and others uh, in the permanent industry. Uh, and it's only with the establishment of the Ben Joe Moon Museum. So the Ben Joe Moon Museum is a museum established in Doha, Qatar, um, around 2012, 13, 14, that's focused on slavery. Draws heavily actually on these British land mission records as inspiration for and, is, and even as evidence in the museum to talk about slavery, its global dimensions, um, in the Indian context, uh, and even uh, there are certain parts of the exhibits there that focus on slavery and, 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 and even make connections to migrant labor work. Today, so it's, it's, it's quite, you know, in many ways, you, you can see it as radical in the context in terms of what it puts on the table uh, in terms of uh, slavery. Um, when discussions about slavery in the public sphere uh, are still very fraught or something that people shy away from um, for a range of reasons, um, some of which may be already. Evident to individuals in the audience who may be familiar, others of which we can discuss more in, in the QA. Um, so, let me highlight a few of these elements here, and then I'm going to start talking uh, more about GIS map making and how we uh, began to work with this data. Right, so, the problem, part of the challenge is, is the data is one, it's overwhelmingly uh, oral testimony translated by a British, a British political. So conversations um, uh, occurred in, in, in Arabic, um, but were translated by the British political agent um, with commentary from the agent. Of course, you're depending on what records survived versus which didn't. Uh, and there's an inconsistent use of different racial and ethnic descriptors, as well as the locations of towns, regions, countries, and states. Right? So again, when people are referenced, as having been transited through or sold in particular places, right? 
and it's not consistent in terms of are we talking about towns, are we talking about kind of modern day or at that time modern day kind of nation uh, category, uh, are we talking about uh, a region, uh, etc. So all of this makes it really challenging, especially as you're trying to then plot on a map with, with longitude and latitude coordinates. What are you plotting? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about GIS. So GIS, Geographic Information Systems, is a system that creates, manages, analyzes, and maps a whole range of data types. Um, it connects the map uh, to various types of descriptive information, and provides a foundation for both mapping but also for analyzing uh, such data uh, as well. Hopefully, uh, toward the end of understanding patterns, relationships, uh, and a larger kind of geographic context, right, in which you're trying to frame one of the data. Um, GIS involves hardware, software, data, people, and a range of methods. Right? A popular uh, assertion, a foundational notion, Sometimes referred to as the first law of GIS is that everything is related to everything else, but nearer things are more related than just the past. So GIS technology, right? Again, GIS includes the technology, right? Uh, uh, so GIS science, excuse me, or GIS technology applies the science with tools for understanding and collaborating. So maps become a geographic container of various data layers. It's important to think about data layers um, uh, and analytics. Different kinds of data layers for using uh, spatial location, right? So this can include uh, the data layers can be imagery, can be various features, can be base maps uh, that are linked to spreadsheets and tables. Like right? at the moment you can see a uh, spreadsheet that I'm you know, taking data from the manumission records and beginning to move it into a format uh, that makes it more usable within a GIS environment. So there are those who also engage in a kind of a whole branch of GIS that is called critical GIS, right? That, that acknowledges um, GIS can be used as a tool with which to oppress, right? or it can be used as a tool critically to think through how systems of oppression, how technologies have been used, and how might we foreground, recognize, and then try to work around or rethink uh, uses uh, in a manner um, towards some form of social transformation. Right? And so producing new categories uh, and spaces of possibility uh, that expand on uh, the geographies of hope and care and that change social imaginaries um, uh, in favorable, non-hierarchical, class, gender, um, race relations. It's part of what that work seeks to do. Right? So I'm just acknowledging um, that there's a range of ways that people engage in. So what I've done here is, you know, I recognize it's a bit difficult um, to see the details of which, but in essence what I've done is taking, again, this, in essence, were one or two paragraph pages, right, uh, reports, and then began to take and make, so each across is an individual and the evidence acquired in an individual statement, and then move to simply Mapping, so naming what are the locations referenced. Given the inconsistency in terms of the categories, so I've had to then distinguish location of town. Like, so location one will have town, will have country, um, will have the, uh, the activity reference was a person sold, was a person captured at that location. Person work at that location, 
uh, etc. Uh, who is the owner for that location? Um, uh, what is there? What is the position of the owner? Is the owner a merchant, a boat captain, uh, etc.? And then taking the latitude and latitude of the city, the country. Um, uh, so here is where. In the context of working with you know aggregate data, right? We're talking about total about 900 statements, where decisions had to be made, and part of the what I'm doing, seeking to do here, is to be really transparent about what's the limitations, right? And the limitations in terms of what decisions I made, what criticism or questions or ways of rethinking those decisions might you offer, right? Or, or might continue to germinate uh, for me as well. Um, is what I, you know, I'd like us to be thinking about. Right? Um, again, these statements tell the age of the person, the oftentimes the age at which the person was enslaved, so whether the person was born into slavery or you know, enslaved at age 8 or 10, um, etc. Uh, and of course, use that to calculate the years enslaved uh, among others. Uh, and so, let me talk a little bit about this slide here. References some of the categories or types of maps that I've created that, that I'm going to talk about uh, momentarily and um, the challenges with them and what these maps uh, do. Right? So, a distributed flow map, and I'll get out and show it in a moment, will map sites from capture to manumission. Right? So, it'll show those uh, and it'll show the flow to the destinations of Muscat or Sharjah. Because those were among the largest places that where applications occur. Um, and there's a spider diagram that shows the sites of capture to manumission in Bahrain, so where they were either invoked in particular in Bahrain. Uh, I map with start and end points to mark different segments of the journey um, for a certain set of individuals who went from Zanzibar and ended up into one of these locations. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and again, some of the challenges and ways to think, to be informed about you know, how do you read the map as a representation of a person's journey. Right. So here you get a distributed flow map, color coded to individuals who ended up green in Sharjah, red in Bahrain, who ended up in Bahrain. Bahrain and blue and mustard. And so the thickness of the line seeks to represent the volume right, of applicants, of individuals who share the same experience, right, or share you know, that same movement along the path. Right? So oftentimes you'll see a thinner line um, in East Africa, you see some thin lines, very thin lines, to represent that the very low numbers in the data in comparison to. That. And then here's a spider diagram. Um, so it shows the flow from the first place of captivity to the site of the mission. So again, just first place to the site of the mission, right? Not to read as if a person moved exactly along that line, right, to that particular uh, place. Right? Uh, here you see people uh, identified um, uh, in, uh, with Zanzibar. As beginning uh, their life journey as an enslaved person, right? And, and then, so that's the first leg, in essence, right? So the first leg from Zanzibar. Then the second leg, right? So to other locations um, that were part of the second part of the journey. And then here, the third. So part of why I'm showing you these different types of maps is to think about, uh, for us to think collectively about what do different types of maps, what kinds of insights do we get from representing these experiences in different ways uh, on a map. Um, part of what, and when you're dealing with such a, a large data set, then how, you know, then how to use the, the maps one creates 
to, to do kind of justice to the kinds of questions uh, or issues um, that are inherent within the data that the data speaks to. Right? Um, so it's, and it's also about you know, trying to make it visually engaging and visually uh, legible. Right? Part of the aim of the map is to, is to be able to represent it uh, visually for someone uh, in a way that makes it somehow better enhances understanding. Right? Uh, and so I'm trying to think through in part ways in which to do that, even with trying to break apart different segments of the journey um, as well. Uh, and trying to think through the larger patterns. And so, what do we learn about breaking up first, second, third, fourth, sixth, fourth legs in different maps? Uh, and again, the data itself is inconsistent in terms of the number of places that mark in the region of the journey. Right? Some people may just have two places. They were captured or born into slavery in one place, and they ended up in Manhattan in another place. And that's all that they represent uh, in, their, in, in, the, in the testimony that they offer. There are some others who who reference eight different locations. Um, and so again, that makes it uh, challenging, but it also makes it rich in terms of that the experience of enslavement varied tremendously uh, in some significant ways in terms of the places uh, where people uh, existed. But I'm hoping to get to towards um, being able to draw some large conclusions about patterns, right? So, so that's where I'm ultimately so how to best represent via maps the networks of enslaved, and so again, this is speaking to the larger question, right? the network of enslaved transport, sale, and work, of children and women's mobility and exploitation within such a region, of the racialized family and community formation under slavery and manumission. Uh, as connected to a pattern of settler colonialism. Um, and we can you know, even come to the question of why might I frame it or by thinking of it as a settler colonial uh, context um, when it doesn't tend to get discussed or analyzed in the same kind of way in which you know, you think about South Africa as a particular kind of yeah. often cited case of settler or even in the plantation societies of the Americas, for instance. So what is it about how one, how do we define what is a settler settler colony uh, uh, to engage as well? How might maps emphasize the labor, work skills, right, domestic, uh, water transport, game, or pearl production? How might they offer um, and for understanding the development of racial capitalism. Uh, so there's a concept of, of racial capitalism um, that, that seeks to understand the connection, um, that seeks to one, offer a critique of capitalism by foregrounding race, uh, and foregrounding that racialization uh, is, is core to the development of capitalism from Slavery uh, through kind of extractive labor regimes that you know, reference here, but, but uh, in various colonial contexts uh, and even in post colonial contexts, uh, to think about neoliberalism and, and, and different forms of labor movement, some of which are referenced even, even in the Ben Joe movies in terms of right? um, And all of this is part of uh, what you could call uh, as racial capital. Because of the way in which it helps to mark who, which individuals' labor is exploited, and how the system has evolved to to recognize that and to make certain individuals' labor more exploitable, less within a global capitalist system, and others less exploitable. And I'm even arguing again that the way in which African versus Arab is depicted within these many mission reports reflects that kind, of, uh, that kind of history and that kind of process as well. Okay, 
here, you know, just restate questions um, that I'm posing. Uh, so I've tried in this presentation, I want to give you a sense of what got me into this project. That it has a grounding in inheritance, right? It's something you're all familiar with, right? And that Egypt is known for its distinctive uh, heritage. Uh, so in asking questions about the way in which a society narrates its history, constructs a sense of who is part of that society of that community, right? And tries to talk about the relations among and what is distinctive about such places. Right? All of that is what you know, let me start asking questions literally as I'm walking in the Dubai Museum and a number of museums uh, in the Emirates and asking questions about so why does there seem to be a more ref representation darker skin features that would be more commonly associated with people of African descent. In pearling and fish, right, um, then as merchants. Right? So I just started just, you know, kind of visually paying attention to, you know, what's how are images, how are um, exhibits right, used, and what, what are the, what's the messaging that, that, that occurs, whether explicitly being foreground or implicitly. Right? Explicitly in terms of people of certain physical features over-represented you know, or represented to a significant and a greater degree in one context, in one domain, uh, than another. And yet noticing no reference to any connection to Africa, etc. Um, and yet, you know, starting just also just talking to people as well and, um, and recognizing that that there's some level of you know, recognition and association of, um, of slavery with Africa, although again, it's a lot more complicated uh, in the context of the world because uh, people of African descent were one of many peoples who were enslaved uh, there. And this is what makes the Americas context uh, very different uh, as well. Um, so again, I'm just giving you a sense of that that's how I came to this project. And then found the manumission records as offering far a different narrative, a different way of understanding the history of Egypt, um, and asking questions why. Um, as I get ready to close, uh, in, there's a scholar named Ahmed Sakinda, uh, who's a Sudanese scholar, um, focuses on uh, slavery uh, in Qatar. And um, what he's done, is, he's got a book that I think is just coming out this year, um, or it should be out. He's got a book that highlights the continuity between the exact labor regime I've just described in terms of pearling and early oil production in the Gulf, and talking about how the oil companies contract with these exact boat captains for labor that they needed in early oil production in Qatar, which again breaks that, it disturbs how we think about. Slavery, about slavery's ending, about capitalism, about uh, the connections uh, to kind of cash crop economy or uh, wage labor versus slave labor, you know, suggesting that at times there's far more overlap than we would uh, tend to associate. Um, and, 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 and there's a connection, of course, to you know, the kind of afterlives of these individuals from that admission back. Uh, which is an informant of heritage, often by uh, people who are descendants of such enslaved peoples today. And so that's a whole other, there's a whole other ethnographic dimension uh, that I'm doing uh, with this uh, research uh, in my brain. Uh, that's about interviewing musicians. Uh, and as I began to ask a few questions uh, and just spend a lot of time listening, watching, observing. Uh, got some hints, suggestions, some insights um, that some individuals who were in form, the music associated with Pearl, right, and, and that's become an important part of uh, the heritage, uh, not only in my brain, but in other places in the world, um, were themselves, their ancestors worked on these exact vessels. And so these songs, right, and these memories, Passed down within families uh, themselves. Uh, 
So I'll end there in terms of you know, the arc of the research. Really interesting questions, thoughts. I hope I'll give you a lot to ponder and hear your thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, don't pass up uh, getting some coffee or tea or water or uh, cookies back there. Um, uh, and you're going to do that while we're talking and discussing. Um, we have a little over 15 minutes, and I would like to uh, encourage my faculty colleagues uh, to uh, wait uh, until maybe the, the last five or ten minutes. If you're like me, you have tons of questions for to be, but a um, uh, little tradition we have in the history department of trying to let our students uh, ask their questions first. Sometimes I get intimidated once the, the faculty jump in and start asking their questions and stuff. So uh, if we could, if there, if there are any students, uh, first of all, who have questions for Professor Willis, please go ahead. Um, I have a question about uh, the generation of data. So I, want, I didn't get quite to the process which the data was generated. So what happened is that you had the data in manual layer records. And after that, you converted it using some sort of thing to uh, the spreadsheets or the Excel sheets, and then to the maps, right? Right, right, right. But how did that happen? So did you pick your data from the manual, the manual manually? Did you have some specific tool? No, just manual sitting down, and looking at an application, looking at these categories and spreadsheets, and starting just to input. And then over time, more categories developed in this, like at first it was simply location one, location two, location three, etc. Right? I didn't have even the, the designation of location one, master, da, 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 countries, right? So manual, entering in, looking at the narrative, you know, beginning to look at what are the data points represented here. And then as I began to think more and contemplate more about how do I have to make this legible for a GIS environment, then that's where again, I had to add all the extra kind of locational information and recognizing that, that I'm making some decisions uh, and some of it is, has a level of arbitrariness in terms of you know, uh, the longitude, latitude, you know, coordinate for, for a town. Right? Where do you pick that? So, so given that, then I'm not trying to use any kind of like distance analysis to Right. So there are a whole set of tools in a software called ArcGIS, uh, which is a major proprietary software for um, kind of industry standard for GIS. Um, at least in the US, but I think it's, it's, it has much more broken um, in its usage. Um, gosh, I just told you about the I was saying that thing. Um, you're talking about the orange in increasing distance. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. So yes, so, I, so that's where, again, I'm cognizant of what are the things I have to be very careful about not trying to do because, that, because then the data would totally distort, right? Uh, uh, so I, I don't use, for instance, distance right, in my uh, calculations. And again, there are a lot of things that I use that. How do you have the laws of imagination and So. Was, was there any evidence associated with what they were considered using uh, any sort of OCR or Python coding or promising or to you know, get the data automatically and then re edit on it using you know, reviewing and stuff instead of taking it all manually from the beginning? No, no, no. So that's a great question. And it's a great question because, so I think it's the Qatar Library, it's the Qatar government working with the British Library. Etc. I think has done exactly that. So you can actually find now these manumission records online. All of these images, very detailed, um, high megapixel images taken of these records. And then you can also find some text. But this is where you see the slippage, right? Because you can see they've done that, and then in the text that's offered, the OCR of it is all, it's inconsistent and it's jumbled. <laughs> And you can see that, okay, yeah, somebody didn't go through and actually check this. Um, really great talk. It was really enjoyable and very new also, so thank you. Um, so I have like, 
two questions, but I'd just like to be curious inquiries. Um, with, with, like, what would the map look like if you had like, added like a dimension of time into it? Like, was it because of the different time? Because I'm not sure, like you said, it was very much like, how much you see. I'm not sure time period. And the second question was about, in the beginning, you talked about the magnificence and you had the graph that involved like, women and men. And the maps, I'm guessing, are a combination of both men and women or only men? So these maps here are a combination. Uh, uh, there are other maps that I've created for this that actually aggregate or that actually steal uh, uh, this. Yeah, because I was very curious to think about, for example, because you mentioned how the turtle industry is men dominated. How would like, the journey look different for a woman than a man based on what they're doing? Thank you very much. Well, it's both really, really helpful. Um, so, one in terms of the time factor, right? Um, and so, the time period we're talking, the, the overwhelming bulk of the data is like mid 1920s to like late 1930s. It's the kind of bulk of, of the data. Um, the, so this is so I, you know I haven't done that in terms of mapping over time. As I've been thinking about that, part of the challenge becomes how how seriously do you take a person's recollection? Because uh, you, you you know again, so you have a, an overwhelming number of testimonies. People were enslaved, were born into slavery. Right. So. You know, so as, again, as I'm trying to think critically about the sources, I'm trying to think about you know how 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 do I take you know a person who's let's say age 35 or 40, you know, recalling what happened, you know, this you know providing such precision on one hand without any sense of how to how to cross check th those you know I, I don't have any other way to cross check. So um, again, it's something I, that I'm thinking through. Uh, about it, that doesn't mean I shouldn't continue on and, and map it in, in that way, but it's something I'm thinking about as you know, something that's all right. Um, very interesting talk and very informative. Uh, but actually, forgive my ignorance about some parts of that, but uh, I was actually wondering um, like the relation between the people of African descent with the Arabs. Because especially there were a lot of Arabs, uh, Arab diaspora, uh, and people who uh, immigrated from different Arab countries into Africa, uh, mainly like I don't know Tanzania, Kenya, uh, and a lot of other ones. And as opposed to having the colonial powers ruling over uh, whether the Arab region or parts of Africa, so. Uh, I always have this, uh, I always see that there are always these narratives about the colonial powers, which are of uh, European descent, like for example the British Empire or the, the French, uh, the French or whoever, uh, as opposed to Arabs simply immigrating in. Um, I think as uh, in 1880 something, like uh, Zanzibar was part of Oman. Yes. Exactly. So, how do you how do you see these conflicting narratives, and how does it come into the picture? Great question. Um, so you know, the, so you can see in the data, right? The British political agent is assuming, you know, in, in essence, is assuming that people speak only one language, and that language then determines. You know, all aspects of their social life, their culture, etc. Right? Um, which you know, again, in the context of particularly coastal communities, right? Port towns like the place like Zanzibar, places like Muscat, Bahrain, etc. And these, and all these places where the British political agents had set up shop, right? These are places where people are speaking, you know, multiple languages or family relations. Right, so so again, this is where you see the work of the kind of the kind of British gaze 
that colonial narrative and those colonial ways of categorizing people are exactly being applied in, in these moments, right? Um, now, to me, this is one of the ways that I would like to, as the work, as I get into one of the ethnographic dimensions of the work, is to see how some of the same, some of the families who are associated with the music, and so I start there because, for instance, there's a musician that I've been in uh, Bahrain, who one of his ancestors um, I saw in the records because I asked him about, well, this person has the same last name in Bahrain around this time. He's like, oh yeah, that's my cousin. Um, which raises a whole other set of issues in, in terms of you know really being careful, thoughtful, you know about how do you even you know about how do you even have the conversation. In terms of, because in essence, I'm starting with on one level a set of data that is all about identifying people as as as, as enslaved and descendants, of them, right? And yet, I'm I'm going through this other route, the ethnographic, on you know people who are musicians, which you know depending on who you're talking to, you know, various places in the Gulf, even people being in as musicians, you know, there's a complicated way in which people are constructed within the kind of social uh, context of societies, of, whether it's a kind of stigma associated with musicians, stereotypes associated with musicians as well. So it's, but yet, what one can get from that is, again, what's a different, what's a, a narrative of how people themselves remember their own history and remember the history of Hurley. And so you get that more of a kind of bottom line perspective um, as well. So that's ultimately what I'm hoping to be able to bring the two really into conversation to understand, you know, how does this how does this label regime organize and how are people navigating it kind of from both perspectives? Um, well. Let's see if question in here then open it up to faculty questions. We hear a lot about like the treatment of slaves in that like slave trade in regards to this one in the world industry. What was the treatment like? What did you speak to the records that the British kept? Were there any records of stuff like that of the treatment that these uh, slaves faced in the pearling industry? So of course there's the larger narrative association of Atlantic world child slavery with the kind of harsh rule, right? And the kind of stereotypic kind of brutality of slavery that you know, that kind of circulates in kind of popular media uh, today against a more benign narrative that, you know, you know, arguably was a response to a kind of European imperial project, right? And a way of people trying to respond to that, right? Uh, so this is in the context of the decline of the Ottoman Empire, 19th century, et cetera, right? Um, and it, it's kind of association of, um, you know that that Islam provided you know a path for um, for manumission. Uh, that, that one of the you know, most um, desirable things of a, of a Muslim to do would be to to, uh, to free an individual. Right. Um, so so that's there. Now and then the association of you know it's more domestic, it's less brutal, right? So there's that larger kind of. The pearling economy suggests it complicates that, right? Um, because one can see the, the kind of brutality, and, and, and you know, see, if you notice, I tried to focus on a kind of structural relationship, right, between the merchants uh, and the crew members. Um, and I think that structural relationship is important to understand because the way in which the economic uh, way in which People who are a part of early crews are indebted, right? And how and the struggle to be able to get out of debt um, again helped to add to what was already, you know, uh, arguably brutal in terms of just the physical uh, demands and physical violence right, on individuals as well. So, so the pearly industry complicates that narrative. So to acknowledge, one, there's a historical debate 
Hurling, evidence from hurling complicates that. Um, so there are important ways. And I think, you know, it's important to where folks in the Atlantic world, the kind of Indian Ocean world, often get caught up in the kind of reifying this kind of archetype of each domain and not grappling with all the levels of complexity and nuance of how slavery works in both contexts, even though there are some general patterns to that argue about one context versus another. So it's, there's, it's a lot of nuance and a lot of detail that requires to really unpack the question uh, that you raised. It's an extremely important question because it animates the conversation and it drives and it animates so much conversation. I'm wondering what platforms are, um, what platforms or books are available for purchase on? Uh, so the, so this project, I don't have a book yet for this project. There are chapters and articles um, that appear you can find on uh, Amazon. Um, uh, and I'd be more than happy to share other platforms. Yeah, that would be good. I'll share with you. Other thoughts, questions? Yes. So this is difficult to get at, right? Because individuals, you know, typically, you know, don't didn't I, did, there there hasn't been a, a kind of database archive in, you know, uh, of you know the society and you know our people of enslaved origins uh, versus uh, versus not um, the census in places in because so many of the Arab Gulf states, right? come into being as the kind of modern day nation states around 71, 68. Um, this is probably the closest thing for the Indian Ocean that we have for the Atlantic. Right. Yeah. Um, so those individuals become citizens in that sense, right? Yeah. Or, but in the immigrants, there's also this category of the doom, uh, yeah. of individuals who are without papers, without black who, again, you know, this requires a whole other level of ethnographic research, but, but, but it's also difficult to kind of penetrate, right, uh, or to do that kind of research, um, uh, you know, because there's, there's not, there are disincentives for, you know, the society itself isn't trying to make, yeah, it's how it's, it's, it's the way in which these communities are located and their proximity to the expats who have arrived and are living. Uh, and they're often living in such different locations that even the opportunity to come together and to converse uh, is difficult. In a place like Bahrain, even the, you know, going into the court villages uh, as an expat, for instance, unless you, um, is, uh, is discouraged uh, very strongly. And there are people watching to make sure that such you know, doesn't happen. So there's a, there are in, the interest of the state is in keeping the society socially and economically segregated um, uh, in ways that really complicate it and how we would actually go about you know, uh, doing uh, some of this without it having to be a kind of local scholar doing that. And, and you know, it, again, it raises a whole set of complicated issues. For, regardless of where one is located, they're just different issues. All right, well, that's the end of the hour. If you have uh, further questions, by all means, uh, please uh, stick around and, uh, and ask them, uh, of Professor Willis. But uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, let's give Professor Willis one more round of applause. Thank you. By the way, we have more CASAR activities coming uh, later this month and next month, so uh, take a look online, take a look on Facebook for those events. We'll see you. Have a great week. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.